Hey everyone, this is Mike from Comic Book Trove. I'm here today with another Omnibus review. Today I'm going to take a look at The Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 3. Uh, it's a continuation on from Volume 2, funnily enough. Uh, so this is collecting further issues from the, uh, the original Silver Age run of Amazing Spider-Man. Um, this book originally printed back in 2017. That's when I picked it up and for a long time it was kind of a whale. This is going for some pretty crazy prices online on eBay and places like that. Um, but it is getting a reprint this year, uh, due for release sometime in September, I believe. So, uh, you know, I thought I'd take a look at the book just for anyone who's interested, but with that reprint coming as well, I thought it'd be a good idea to give anybody who's maybe not totally sold on it yet, uh, a look at it and maybe help you out and decide if you want to, uh, to go ahead and get that later on this year. Um, but anyway, this cover will be the direct market variant cover, by the way. Um, it was the direct market last time. It will be the direct market cover again for the reprint. It's the cover of uh, issue 101. Uh, pretty wacky classic cover featuring uh, Morbius, the living vampire, and Spidey here with his six arms, which uh, you know we'll get to as we go through this review and, and have a look at what that's all about. But uh, on the back, you know, standard Marvel omnibus thing, uh, cover gallery of the issues involved. Um, Take a look at the content, nice and straightforward down there. It's just Amazing Spider-Man issues 68 through uh, 104. It's just a nice chunk of issues of Amazing Spider-Man. No crossovers, no annuals here to worry about. About as simple as it gets. Um, so I have reviewed previously on the channel issues, uh, sorry, issues, volumes one and two even of this Omnibus series. So feel free to go back and you know check those out um, if you're interested. But really this is, I suppose we could say, as simply as possible, more of the same as what you kind of get in there, in particular, the style that you get in volume two. So, you know, back in my review of that second volume, I discussed how once John Romita came on as the artist, uh, the book and the series gained a pretty distinct look and a pretty distinct feel as well, to be honest, um, that distinguished it from the original Steve Ditko era. And it really set the standards that continued not only through this volume, but really for years and years of, of how amazing Spider-Man was all through the rest of the Silver Age and the Bronze Age and really all through the 80s until Todd McFarlane took over. The contents page here, again, nice and straightforward. Um, introduction by John Romita. You tend to get introductions and uh, afterwards and things throughout these uh, Silver Age and Bronze Age volumes, but they're usually taken from masterworks rather than things written specifically for the omnibus and then you kick off then with the uh, issue 68 and artwork throughout here uh, is not purely by john romita senior anymore uh, he's still he's still around he's still working on the book but uh, he's often kind of just doing the finishing inking slash finishing uh, you start to see uh, more uh, artwork by uh, gil kane john buscema and Jim Mooney as well. So it actually isn't totally clear with some of the issues during this, this particular era who exactly is doing the artwork at times because you get multiple people being credited and sometimes you'll see something that looks very much like it's a bit of John Romita artwork in an issue that's officially credited to you know somebody else. Um, so I think a bit of a, of a collaborative team effort of different artists working on the series during this time. But this initial run, issues 68 through 75, makes up what's known as the uh, the Stone Tablet Saga, which I suppose is really the first kind of prolonged story arc of Amazing Spider-Man, really. Uh, it focuses on a stone tablet, kind of ancient artifact, mystical powers kind of thing. Um, and... You've got Kingpin involved, as you can see throughout these pages, and there's a new gangster who gets introduced as well, a guy called Silvermane, and uh, everybody's kind of after this stone tablet. Um, and Spidey's kind of trying to figure out why is everybody after this. He's just kind of caught in the middle, you know, in typical Spider-Man fashion. You know, he just gets caught in the middle of something that he doesn't fully understand. He ends up taking the blame for stealing the tablet. Everybody thinks it's all his fault because, you know, wouldn't be classic Spider-Man if the world wasn't against him, would it? So, um, but yeah, the artwork throughout here, you know, I've mentioned it's different artists, but it's still got very much that Romita-esque look. So even whether he is specifically the artist on an issue or not, um, 
everything looks very much like the style that Ramita had, uh, had laid out in the issues previously, the ones collected in volume two. And I just really love the way that the faces, I, I mentioned it in that uh, review as well, the second volume, but just the way that Ramita kind of drew the faces, uh, especially, you know, like uh, Peter, Gwen Stacy, you know, handsome slash beautiful faces, really easy on the eye, really appealing artwork, aesthetically very pleasing um, and always fun for me to look at. And a lot of fun going on in the story as well. So I always say that, you know, I understand that Silver Age comics, Bronze Age comics, the older style of those sorts of eras, uh, I know they're not for everybody, but really I think um, that Amazing Spider-Man was absolutely the highest of high quality series that were published during that time. So if you are a Spider-Man fan, but you maybe you've been put off by the old style of comics, um, or you just haven't read that many of them, and you're not sure you want to commit to buying an omnibus, uh, perhaps maybe try out some of these issues on Marvel Unlimited, or I don't know, maybe other collections. But for me, this stuff is highly, highly recommended. And I think, I think most people who have read it, to be fair, uh, understand that it is actually some really good stuff. Um, throughout here, not many kind of significant key issues throughout these these runs. No, not many first appearances really. Uh, off the top of my head, the only real one I can think of is the Prowler. Um, turns up a few in issue 80 something, I think. Um, but not really any significant kind of first appearances going on. Um, there are a couple of kind of key events, I suppose, that do go on in here. Um, so I'll say now, you know, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but sometimes it slips my mind when I'm talking about comics that are this old, but, uh, you know, I realize I'm possibly discussing plot points for things that you may not have read yet, you know, just because these comics are, what, 50 something years old at this point, doesn't necessarily mean everybody's read them. So apologies. I do tend to assume that sometimes wrongly. Um, so we'll cover some plot points from this, this, you know, throughout this review. So... I won't, not in too much detail. I'm not going to spoil anything. And to be fair, I would probably say even the stuff I do mention, I wouldn't have thought it'll ruin your enjoyment or anything of reading these comics if you do go ahead and pick up the book or read the comics in any other way, however you choose to do it. Um, really cool artwork. You know, as, as I flick through here, I'm just reminded of how much I love this stuff. You know, it's been a while since I read, I read through this uh, original Silver Age run probably maybe two or three years since I last read it. So I am due for a reread. And I swear doing these reviews just makes me want to, you know, drop the stuff I'm currently reading and go back to reading this kind of stuff. Because it is classic, very much classic stuff. Um, the lizard is, I always love it when the lizard turns up. He's one of the more interesting Spidey villains, I think. When, at least when the story focuses on that kind of human element of, you know, Dr. Connors and the way his life is affected by this transformation into being the lizard. Um, which the story does here, you know, it focuses on his wife and child and uh, the difficulty that they have put through by the fact that these, these things are going on, these transformations that he's, he goes through. Um, issue, yeah, so we go to issue 78, here's the Prowler. Um, cool thing about the Prowler, nice bit of trivia, is that he was his costume was designed by John Romita Jr. There is actually a little thank you here that uh, thanks to John Romita Jr. for suggesting the Prowler. It was an idea that John Romita Jr. came up. He was only a kid at this time. I, I think he was a teenager. Um, certainly wasn't officially working in comics yet, although of course he would go on to do so. Um, but yeah, I always thought that was pretty cool. That he, you know, managed to suggest something that his dad ended up, I assume, passing on to Stanley, and it was decided that he actually would get used. Pretty cool. Um, and yeah, Prowl's a pretty good character. Not one of the absolute best. Nice splash page there, but he is cool. Nice idea. What you also get in here as well. Um, during this time, Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy are in a relationship, but 
you know, it's it's pretty much always strained. It's funny with the relationship between Peter and Gwen. Gwen is often referred to as as Peter Parker's first love, like first real love interest. Um, and she was, I suppose, but you wouldn't really necessarily think it to read these issues now. I can't help but think that history has been a little bit kind to how we kind of view Gwen Stacy's relationship with uh, with Peter Parker during this time, because most of their interactions, their relationship together, the majority of the time, it is her getting upset with him because she doesn't understand why he tends to run off, you know, when there's danger around. She's got it in her head that he's a coward, you know, that he's just too scared, that he'll never be able to protect her or himself. And obviously the reality is that he's Spider-Man, so the majority of the dynamic is her kind of getting upset with him, angry with him, running away crying, and him sort of going, how am I going to explain it to her you know what am i going to do um there are a few moments where they do seem genuinely happy together i'm not going to say there aren't but it's just that kind of typically frustrating thing where you know everything seems to stack up against peter he's just the unluckiest guy in the world that kind of thing um but then in terms of that relationship one of the key events that does come up uh during this run is that her dad uh, captain stacy who's a uh, i think he's technically retired a retired police chief he ends up uh, getting killed um basically caught caught out and on, takes collateral damage as a result of a fight between spidey and doc ock some debris falls on him from a rooftop crushes him and yeah Obviously, that's a, that's a big deal. Getting slightly ahead of myself, though, as I tend to do. Um, I'm not quite there yet in terms of the issues, but I'll show those issues off. But the cool thing about the character, I thought Captain Stacy was a good, a good character during this time because he is clearly kind of getting a bit uh, suspicious of Peter. It's, it's kind of hinted at that he knows there's more going on with Peter than meets the eye. Um, couple of little subtle hints at times that suggest maybe does he know that Peter is Spider-Man um, but yeah so you know all these sorts of things going on subplots running through the issues and all the while you got Spidey taking on his usual kind of assortment of rogues gallery villains uh, oh this is a, this issue actually just quickly show this off another one of those with a bit of Trivia to it, issue 86. Uh, this is actually the first appearance of the Black Widow's now iconic kind of all black leather jumpsuit, catsuit, spy suit. I don't know what you officially call it. But originally she'd been wearing this costume. It's kind of not particularly good thing with a cape and a mask. Um, in this issue, she actually decides that she's gonna revamp herself revamp her costume and uh, yeah this this is the very first issue where she is debuted appearing in this in my opinion much better costume um, and she gets into you know a fight with spider-man as you do because why not spidey's just swinging around minding his own business and the black widow decides that she's gonna get into a fight with him Really just serves as, a, the whole issue pretty much just serves as a showcase for Black Widow in her new costume and then at the bottom of the final page, even a shameless advert to say, you know, go ahead and read Black Widow's adventures in Amazing Tales. Um, just goes to show, even back then, you know, Spider-Man already at this time, Marvel's most popular character and their most popular way of... Uh, trying to get attention towards other characters was to have them guest star in Spider-Man or have Spider-Man guest star in their comics. It's a tried and true Marvel method. Spider-Man generally boosts interest. Um, cool issue here as well. Spidey, uh, well, Peter Parker is ill, got some kind of fever, and he ends up confessing to everybody that he is Spider-Man. It's kind of a do-do-do moment. Um, very soap opera dramatic kind of thing. Um, and he ends up getting out of it by, I think, well, using the prowler, yeah, actually. 
Um, Prowler kind of owes him a favour, I think, so he asks the Prowler to put on Spider-Man costume and make an appearance, uh, you know, in front of everybody else as Spider-Man, whilst Peter Parker is conveniently there to uh, to prove to prove that it's that he is not Spider-Man, and that's how that's solved. That's a, such a soap opera type storyline. It's <laughs> so silly but so fun. Um, and this issue from here, I think this issue runs through a couple of issues. This storyline. This is where Doc Ock is back. Doc Ock's always back, you know, honestly. The guy doesn't go away for more than, I don't know, 10 issues at a time, it seems like. Honestly, you get a bit tired of him. He just shows up more often than the other villains, so... I don't know. I just... I think I get a little bit fatigued. A little bit weary of reading uh, all the Doc Ock stories, because he just shows up all the time. Uh, I'm sure this is the issue, 89, the big dramatic one with Captain Stacy. Or not, it'll be this one, issue 90. I know what I'm talking about, I swear. Cool action sequence, a really nice penciling, nice artwork. Do sometimes wish with some of these issues, like Stan Lee's tendency when he was writing pretty much anything, was to just fill, yeah, he could barely let a panel go by without throwing some dialogue in there, even if it was completely unnecessary. Like, you know, these issues, these sequences, some of these would look perfectly fine with far less or even no dialogue in some of these panels. But uh, yeah, Stan couldn't help it, could he? It's, ah, well, it's endearing. I kind of think it's a bit fun. Um, but yeah, this is it. So some rubble falls off. Captain Stacy saves a child, sacrifices himself. Spidey rushes him away, but it's too late. But in these awesome final words, this final moment for the character, he reveals that uh, he knew all along, or at least for a while, that Peter was Spider-Man and he just asks him, Spidey is masked here, and he just says, look after Gwen, you know, take care of her for me. Sweet moment, sad moment. Um, but of course, because it's Spider-Man, despite the fact it's not his fault, everybody is now determined to believe that Spider-Man was the murderer. And in particular, that causes a strain with Gwen Stacy and Peter. She's feeling completely distraught. Obviously, over the loss, that makes sense, but she decides to, you know, she decides she now hates Spider-Man, which just throws a further wrench into Peter's life, because not only was the relationship tricky enough already, but now he feels like he was thinking about telling her he is Spider-Man. Now he can't, because she thinks Spider-Man killed his dad, and oh my goodness me, it's just crazy. Really is a superhero soap opera, and I love it. Um, so melodramatic, all this stuff. Uh... Cool issue here with Iceman, guest starring. I think this was during the years where the X-Men were in limbo because X-Men had been cancelled and not yet kind of uh, rebooted or re re restarted. I don't know. Anyway, during the years where X-Men wasn't being published, which seems crazy to say now that there were years where X-Men wasn't being published, but there you go. Um, so Gwen goes off to London she leaves America, she leaves New York, she goes off to London to stay with some distant relatives or something. Um, and that storyline with her going to London was, you know, hor horrifically retconned in that god-awful Sins Past story. Thought about whether or not I was even going to mention it then, but I thought, nah, yeah, I will do. Even though I'd pretend it didn't happen. But anyway, that's as much as I'm going to say about that. So Gwen leaves anyway, she goes off to London, Spidey chases her, so we get an issue with Spider-Man in London. Pretty interesting. Bit of a novelty. Um, and, and yeah, he kind of realises that it's a bit of a silly idea for him to go and be Spider-Man in London, because if Peter Parker's just travelled to London and suddenly Spider-Man's showing up in London fighting criminals, then maybe people will actually put two and two together on that one. So I think he leaves before he actually 
gets a chance to chat to Gwen. Can't remember, to be honest. Um, but this issue, issue 96, issues 96, 97 and 98, are famous for one significant reason, is that they were the first issues of Amazing Spider-Man, and I think, as far as I'm aware, the first issues published for any comic by Marvel or DC, and most publishers, um, since the creation of the Comics Code Authority, that did not include the Comics Code seal. You see, it is not there. That approved by the Comics Code Authority is not there at all. Because what this, de this story deals with is uh, it basically provides one big uh, story arc that delivers an anti-drugs message. I think the story goes that Stan Lee was approached um, by whichever US government department deals with you know, tackling drug issues. Uh, I sound very educated right now. Um, and he was asked to do an anti-drug story uh, in a comic, you know, as a way to try and tell the children that comic that <laughs> comic, that drugs are bad. Um, and he agreed. So even though Comics Code strictly prohibited any mention whatsoever of drugs, even if it was a strong anti-drug message, uh, Stan managed to go ahead and get permission from his boss, uh, Martin Goodman, to publish these stories anyway. So he did. So you get three issues published with no Comics Code seal, and the world didn't explode, and people start to realise maybe we can actually start to uh, cover some more mature themes. You know, try out some more mature storytelling in comics. Because you know what? Marvel just published those three issues of Amazing Spider-Man. And they still sold. People didn't lose their minds over the fact they didn't have a silly comic book seal on the front. Um, so yeah, it kind of can uh, credit these issues in a way with really being the, the starting point for people realising that the strict rules of the comics code were unnecessary. You didn't need to censor things that strictly. And the comics code itself started to become more liberal, you know, it loosened, it loosened the rules um, over the coming years until eventually it became completely redundant. By the, t by the 80s, even though the comics code seal was still there, I think people had pretty much stopped caring. But for this point in time, it was a big deal to not get that seal on the comic. Nowadays, it doesn't exist at all. I think it was officially disused, um, discontinued, whatever, about at least 10, 15 years ago now. But yeah, so it's a cool story, though. Um, the drug thing isn't even the central point of the story, really. It's, I mean, it kind of is. It's, it's more of a subplot, really. Uh, it's Harry Osborne has basically become addicted to pills. There's nothing, no specific drug is mentioned. He just takes pills. Um, so there's like an intervention for him. But then you get to issue 100. Really cool cover. I always liked that one. Um, and uh, this is the issue. The last issue that Stan Lee wrote in his unbroken run. So he did come back after this and write a handful more issues. But really, this was the final issue of his of his complete Amazing Spider-Man run. And I always thought, I felt so bad. for the, After this, Roy Thomas was the next writer. And he only wrote four issues, but... This issue ends with one of the most ridiculous Spider-Man moments of all time, which is where Peter Parker tries out some kind of experimental formula um, and grows four extra arms. And that's where the issue ends. So imagine being Roy Thomas and Stan Lee, who's just written 100 issues of Spider-Man and could have left at any much more conventional point just goes, there you go, Roy. Carry on this story with a six-armed Spider-Man. And so I just always thought, that must have just been such an awkward thing to have to deal with. And that's exactly what he did. So, issue 101, you get Roy Thomas. He's now scripting it. And he's got to deal with this story with <laughs> six-armed Spider-Man. And it is every bit as silly as it sounds. But, you know, I suppose silly in a fun way. And this also happens to be the first appearance of Morbius. So this is that issue, you know, from the, the dust jacket. And this in itself, this was kind of another way of testing the waters of the whole Comics Code thing. Because Comics Code had strictly prohibited the use of monsters like vampires in comics. 
So Morbius wasn't exactly a vampire. He was kind of just v sort of vampiric. Um, I think they were trying to see again if they could get away with that, and they did. So then again, you know, not too far after this, you had Marvel publishing Tomb of Dracula and going, going for a full-on vampire series. Oh, very cool here. Comic, hist comic book history fascinates me. I, honestly, I've, I've had so much fun in the last few years just reading old comics and learning about the history of comics. I could talk about it all day. And it's why I love reading these old kind of comics. You know, for me, omnibus format is absolutely, in many ways, it's almost like it was invented as the best way to read these old comics because it's such a cool way of reading these older, this older stuff. Uh, this final story arc here, 103 and 104, I always loved this cover, it's really cool. It's pretty simple really, I suppose, it's not the best cover ever, but I just thought it was really cool, kind of Spider-Man in the Savage Land, and it's a great story as well. Basically, there's a Daily Bugle expedition to go to the Savage Land, so J. Jonah Jameson goes along, he brings Peter as a photographer, and Gwen comes along, I think she comes along as a model. So you get to you get Gwen in a bikini. So you know there's that, you know. If nothing else, you get that. Um, and yeah, so it's a very kind of uh, I don't know. This kind of really reminds me of those old sort of B movie, sci-fi movies from the fifties and sixties. Those kind of cheesy old movies, monster movies. Uh, and you get this uh, this big creature, you know, kind of kidnaps. Gwen in some sort of King Kong style. Uh, Craven the Hunter, he's kind of behind it. And you also get Kazar, Kazar, I never know which way you say that. But he shows up because the Savage Land is, you know, it's his whole thing, his whole thing. He lives there. He is like it's Tarzan. Um, yeah, so it's a team up basically. It's a team up between Kazar, Spider Man, taking down Craven and his, his big creature. King Kong thing that's not King Kong. Yeah, good fun. One of those little quick story arcs that just kind of breaks up the status quo a little bit. Get Spider-Man out of New York, different surroundings, different type of story to deal with. And then extras in the back, you know, usual kind of stuff, lots of sketches, very cool stuff, lots of John Romita artwork, like early pencils. Quite a lot in here actually. I forgot how much extra kind of unfinished original art was in here. But a lot of good stuff. You know, hopefully that's provided a good idea of the book. Uh, you know, and the style of the story is within. Plenty of just extra sketches and cover art on the back here. More modern covers here. Cool, Amazing Fantasy 15 homage. Uh, oh yeah, that was the standard, that well, was and will be the standard variant cover for the Omnibus. A lot of people didn't like that one. I've got to say, I saw a lot of negative reaction to that cover. Um, but you can make your own mind up, of course. Anyway, that is that. So thank you for watching that and sticking with me through another Omnibus review. I hope it was of interest. Um, it's a great series, honestly. I, I love these all-day Amazing, Amazing Spider-Man comics and I love this volume series that's been ongoing to the point where we're still getting a volume five this year. So that'll be very exciting to pick up. But yeah, thanks as always for watching, and if you're going to leave a like in the video, comment below if you're going to be picking the book up, or you already have it, or your thoughts on the run in general, whatever you want to say, happy to chat. Um, but yeah, thanks again for watching, and I'll check back with you soon with another video.